Well, welcome, folks. Here we are at uh, the start of your Algebra 2 year with Section 1-1 in Mr. Emiot's class. And what I want to start with, because we are starting a brand new, brand new chapter and a brand new year, I want to start with just a little bit of information about the flipped classroom and how it works and and, and how best to keep you guys uh, on task and also just to, to benefit the most from this clip classroom thing that you can. Now the flipped classroom um, is not is not this right here. Okay, it's not taking the classroom and flipping it upside down. That that's not what we're looking for with the flip flip classroom. What the flip classroom is is it flips the homework that you do and the classwork that you do. So in a in a traditional setting classroom in class the teacher would lecture for you know a half hour to 40 40 minutes or so and then at home for your homework you would work on problems and maybe you'd get 20 or 30 homework problems to work on and you'd work on those well what the flip classroom does is it flips these two things and the the key here is when you go home and you're frustrated when you're working on the problems at home, you're, you're, you know, you're sitting at the kitchen table. Your parents can't help you, or, or you, you know, don't have an older brother and sister around to help you, and you're looking at those problems, and you, and you have no way of getting those problems done. If you do those problems in school, you're working with classmates. The, you know, me as the teacher, I'm cruising around the room trying to help you out. And, and we get them done together, we get them done better, and, and you know what you're doing, and your grade will improve, and you'll do better in class. Now, the, the flip side of it is that when you go home, your homework is to do something that is only graded upon completeness. That is, watch the lecture like you're doing right now online. You, you log on. Uh, the best, best, easiest way to do it is you're going to Google Mr. Emiat, and you're going to find my website. And when you Google Mr. Emiat and you find my website, you're going to be all set. You're going to uh, enter into to whatever section you're on. You have your notebook. You take it home. You can print notes off of the website if you need to. They'll they'll be right on there for you. Print those notes out, and and there there you're all set. You're all started to go, and you hit the lecture, and you just copy down the notes from the lecture. There are a few key points in the that I've seen over the year of you know people who are successful in the flipped classroom and people who are not. Some some the number one thing to do watch the lectures. It, it it's it sounds silly that I'm even saying it, but it's easy to get lazy. Um, sorry for my hand, right? It's easy to get lazy. And not watch the lectures. You have to watch them all. You have to take the notes. It's you know, you copy it from somebody beside you, or or get it on the bus or whatever. You know, you're just not going to get as much out of it as as actually watching the lectures. If if I thought you could get as much out of it by just writing down all of the notes, I would just give you the notes completed and say go home and read them. Number two, it, it is key to try all the checkpoints. It, on, each, on each set of uh, notes, we'll get to a checkpoint, and I'll say pause the video and try it, and then play the video and, and see the answers. It, I understand that you know your time is valuable and you want to blow right through that. If you do blow right through that, you are, are, are going to get less out of it. It's plain and simple. If you if you do the checkpoints, you, you'll be much better off. Number three, not only watch the lectures, but listen to the lectures. I don't know how many times I, I have kids who say, well, I can't understand your handwriting. Well, writing my handwriting is not great, as you can tell. But it, it is also even made worse because of my... Because of you know, the, the method of, of which I'm writing. So you have to listen to the lectures on top of, 
of watching the lectures to get the most out of it. You'll, if you're listening, you'll know what I'm writing because I'll be saying it as I'm writing it. And um, number four, use class time wisely. If you do all the lectures, the you will be and and you come into class and you work use your time wisely. You will do great in this class because you'll have all your homework done. You'll have good grades on all your homework. You'll know what you're doing. And then you'll do well on the tests and quizzes. But if you come to class and you don't utilize that time to get all your homework done, um, you're going to be a little bit behind. So with all that being said, let's get started. We're on section one dash one. We are. Um, we're ready to get going. I hope you have your notebook. If you don't have your notebook, print off the notes from the website and come back. So let's let's see what we got here. In section 1.1, we are applying properties of real numbers. Now, this, all of this stuff should be reviewed from a previous course. Um, maybe, maybe this is going to be a really easy lecture for you. You know, maybe it's review that you need. There's a reason why we review, because sometimes we forget. So let's see here. Opposites. Now, the first thing we know about opposites is positives and negatives. Those are the opposites. What's the opposite of 5? Negative 5. What's the opposite of 2? Negative 2. What's the opposite of 4.73? Negative 4.73. So, opposite means the, the, the negative or the opposite value. So, if, we're, if, we're, if I said to you, what's the opposite of negative 2? You would say that's positive too. So those are all opposites of each other. And reciprocals would be flipping them upside down. So if I have two-thirds, the reciprocal of two-thirds, three-halves. If I have the number five, the reciprocal of the number five, well, five is really five over one. So the reciprocal of five over one is one over five. Okay, so those are reciprocals. And then when we talk about subsets of real numbers, um, I don't know if you guys remember, there's... There's these circles, and maybe you probably had them in middle school. You start out with those, that small circle, and those would be like the counting numbers. And then you have a bigger number than that. And that would be the whole numbers. And then bigger than the whole numbers would be the integers. Okay. And then bigger than the integers would be all the rational numbers. And when I think of rational, I think of fraction. Any number that can be written as a fraction would be a rational number. And then what what's outside of the rational numbers would be irrational numbers, numbers that cannot be written as a fraction. So the, re the real numbers consist you know, of, of a lot of different sets, but all counting numbers are whole numbers. All whole numbers are integers. All integers are rational. And then there's another set of numbers that are irrational that, that include numbers like pi, because it cannot be written as a fraction, e, because it cannot be written as a fraction, and so numbers like those. All right, so in the set of real numbers, we have rational numbers. There's one of those instances where you probably could not tell what that is without my voice. And irrational numbers. All right. Two subsets of the rational numbers would be the whole, what's inside of the rational numbers. We have the integers and we have the whole numbers. Counting numbers are part of the whole numbers. Remember, counting numbers are 1, 2, 3, 4, plus the number 0 would make them whole numbers. So here we have whole numbers, and here we have integers. Okay, let's take a look at example 1. It says, graph the real numbers, negative 13 fifths and the square root of 6, on a number line. Well, negative 13 fifths, 5 goes into 13 two times, so it's like negative 2.6, it's about right there. And the square root of 6 is, it's almost like 
right in here somewhere. Put that on your calculator. You'd find that the that's about 2.4. And this is negative 2.6. And so we graph those right there on our number line. All right. Um, here we are on the second page of our notes. And, and you have these properties. You need to know what these properties are. It, a, a, B, and C are all real numbers. You need to know that ahead of time. Closure is this first property, and that's the one that we don't remember very well, probably. Closure says if you take real numbers and you add them together, you're going to get a real number. If you take real numbers and you multiply them, you're going to get a real number. Okay. The commutative property means A plus B equals B plus A. I wonder how many of you out there could pause right now and just fill in the rest of this sheet. That might be a great little tool. Commutative property would mean A times B is B times A. Notice everything on the right here is multiply, and everything on the left is addition. So both of these, all of these properties exist in addition and multiplication. They have little different meanings, though. Associative property, I would say A is associating with B right now, but now B is associating with C. And so A plus B plus C equals A plus B plus C. And it's the same thing with multiplication. A is so associated with B over here, but now B is going to start associating with C. Alright, the identity property, what, what could you do in addition to not change what something looks like? Well, if we did A plus 0, that would equal A. Or 0 plus A in the same way. Would equal A. That's supposed to be an A there. In multiplication, we're multiplying by 1. 1 times A would equal A. And then the inverse, basically, what do you do in addition to get you back to the identity? What would you do to something to make it 0? What would you add to it? Well, if you add the opposite of it, that would work. And in multiplication, you would multiply by the reciprocal, and that would get you back to 1, which is, remember, the identity. So, the... The following property involves both addition and multiplication. It's called the distributive property. They don't have that, it doesn't go in either category because it uses both. And I like to call it the whoop whoop property. Can I get a whoop whoop? AB plus AC. Just like that. All right, let's take a look at example two. In example two, we we're working with a lot of different things here but what's happening you have six times three times two equals six times three times two that to me looks like certainly a multiplication problem and what kind of multiplication problem that's associative you don't want to abbreviate that one that's the associative property of multiplication. What happened on this next one? 21 plus negative 21 equals 0. That looks like the inverse property of addition. Okay, you guys now pause this, take a look at checkpoint 1 and 2, and then come back and, and see if you, you were able to do these. So just pause it real quick. All right, welcome back. Hopefully, hopefully you're able to do these ones here. Hopefully you had a dot for negative 3.2 right there. A dot right on negative 2 right there. So I got that one done. I got that one done. Uh, a dot for negative 1 half right here. Got that one done. A dot for 3 fourths right here. And then a square root of 5 is just after the 2, isn't it? It's right here. Got that one done. So hopefully you had all those dots listed. And then what property was this? Hopefully you said the distributive property. Now, if you didn't get either one of those or you missed one of those, go back. Look at the look at what you missed and why you missed it. All right. Defining subtraction and division. Uh, what I always say is there in, in advanced algebra, there is no such thing as subtraction or division anymore. There is Subtraction is defined as adding opposites. So subtraction uh, is the adding the opposites um, in or the additive inverse right and and division is really multiplying by reciprocals 
Now they've kind of multiplying by reciprocals. They've made that easy for you by, by using subtraction and division. We won't do a lot of subtraction and division in, in advanced algebra. Mostly just adding and multiplying in, uh, of the inverses. So you'll have to know how to do that. Okay. And let's take a look at example three here. Example three says show that nine plus b minus nine equals b. Well, I can. What properties do I use? First of all, the definition of subtraction says that there's no such thing as subtraction anymore. That's kind of a weird definition, isn't it? And then I can commutative property. I can move those things around and call it nine, negative nine plus b. And now I can use the associative property to put those together. And 9 plus negative 9 equals 0. Boy, this is feeling like geometry class, isn't it? So just a proof here, right? And 0 plus b equals b. It's explaining every single step. All right. You pause this. Take a look at number 3 and see if you can manipulate checkpoint 3 just like I did example 3. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you did this. Hopefully you said five times a times one fifth equals a, and you called that the definition of division. Okay. And then the next step, you switch these two around using the commutative property and did five times one fifth times a equals a and you call that the commutative of multiplication of course and then we have things that are now associated together new associates new buddies right the associative property And now I have these two things that when I multiply them together, I get 1 times a equals a. And that's the inverse. 5 times 1 fifth because of the inverse property now equal 1. And because of the identity property, a equals a. All right, just kind of an easy little proof. Well, that's section 1-1. One, one. This is the first lecture in a long line of lectures that we'll be doing together. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Now, if there's anything that happened on this lecture, here's the, here's the key. If there's anything that happened that you didn't understand, start writing down questions for yourself. What questions do I have? Because the first five to ten minutes of class tomorrow, Mr. Emiat's going to say, hey, what questions do you have? Where was I not very good on that lecture? What was example three, example two? What do you need to see again? And, you know, if you have questions, you write them down. Ask those in the first five to ten minutes. I'll explain the whole thing back to you to make sure we're ready to tackle those problems together in class. Uh, if you need anything, let me know as soon as possible. Otherwise, see you later.